Okay, record. So, <laughs> welcome all to the. Uh, this is the fourth event of our CCMI um, cancer CCMI on uh, software seminar series. Um, today we have Dexter Pratt from UC San Diego, director of software development in the Edeker Lab and director of the Cytoscape and Index projects. And he's going to take us through the Cytoscape um, ecosystem, the popular network visualization analysis tool. I'm going to be admin, so if there's any questions, pop them into the chat, and um, I can maybe, if, if they're pertinent, I might be able to stop Dexter as we go, because it's kind of a smaller crowd. I think we may be able to do a little bit of stop and go, but um, if you have any questions, just pop them into the chat, and uh, we'll be able to address them. So um, over to you, Dexter. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I'm going to, I think, given that, I'm going to go a little quicker, and then you can pause longer to, 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 to answer questions. So, <clears throat> okay, so I think probably everybody here knows that Cytoscape is a widely used desktop application for visualization and analysis, but one of the differences in this presentation is that these days Cytoscape is a lot more than that. The Cytoscape project, and we're now trying to use the word Cytoscape to mean everything that we do, uh, includes cloud data, web interfaces, and integration with Python and R. So I'm going to describe the major tools, really mostly the Cytoscape desktop, but a couple of other things. Uh, and this will be a high-level tour. So I've scattered a bunch of links in the into this. So the doc, this document afterwards will be a place that you can link out to the documentation. But going to Cytoscape org, uh, that has all the, the links to everywhere. Okay, uh, I should say that if any of you are interested to follow up and learn more, then Alex is giving uh, a two in-depth classes, uh, one on Tuesday and an intermediate course next Monday. So I think probably most of you know Alex, uh, if you're in around UCSF Gladstone, uh, if you haven't met him, then you should. Okay, what's our motivation? What do we get out of networks? Networks are a data structure that can be used to make models of the world as interactions between things. For example, synthetic lethal reactions between genes, protein binding, drug target binding, or cell-cell signaling relationships. And we can model causal relationships, AKT phosphorylates GSK3 beta, which in turn inhibits ac its activity. BRAF mutation leads to melanoma. Well, so what? One reason is that networks can be used to visualize a set of interaction data and help you discover structures in those relationships. Seeing those structures, seeing that how that network's put together may help you form hypotheses about the active biology in your experiment. In this presentation, I'll show you ways to create network visualizations, store them, and share them publicly. The logo in the middle represents Cytoscape tools, and as we were saying, uh, notably the Cytoscape desktop application. So there's a visualization workflow. Create a network, visualize it, map data to the visual styles, store and share the networks. Another reason is to interpret data by using prior knowledge that is expressed in a network. <clears throat> So you want a reference network. The reference network might be the one that you just created, or it might be a small network, one that was curated as a model of a pathway. So that's projecting your data onto a known pathway. Or it might be a large public set of interaction data, such as the Bioplex 3 data shown above as a network with about 70,000 edges. And Bioplex 3 isn't big. Bioplex 3 is cool because it's all one kind of, of interaction that's uh, experimentally determined. <clears throat> but the string database, for example, is 5 million edges, uh, 420,000 of the high confidence ones. In this case, the reference interactions help us review the knowledge that's relevant to the data, possibly to see structures in those interactions. So you can add your data as properties of the nodes in the network. For example, adding an expression fold change and a p-value to a protein. The next step is to select the subsystems and other structure in the network proximal to the proteins with the significant changes in their genes. 
And then finally, you try to understand those subsystems, performing Go enrichment or something like that. Now, this is a more granular focused analysis than simply running Go. The, uh, you know, very frequently people take their genes, genes of interest, they run Go analysis on them. But, you know, if you've got 100 genes, that's going to give you a very blurry picture. So you need to find ways to find subsets of that world in order <clears throat> to look closely at that. There is very likely to be active biology that only involves you know, a minority of your genes. <clears throat> and so it's not going to get a, an enrich beyond the, it's not going to be the top enrichment score in your uh, analysis. And in fact, it might not even be the, in the top uh, 20 based on the way that Go works. So at a high level, these are the common uses, and that's what's in the presentation. So other, other uses in, of, of networks in biology are great. These are the ones that people are doing all the time, and we've only got an hour. So data interpretation workflow, map expression data or other per entity data to a network, find the subsystems, interpret the subsystems. And Probably given this audience, I'm guessing all of you know that this is the Cytoscape desktop application. Cytoscape started in 2001, uh, you know, created by Trey Eidecker. And so it's been 20 years. And Cytoscape's grown to be the standard resource for systems biology and for network biology in academia and in industry. And this widespread adoption reflects that it's good for many kinds of biological analyses. And it's also because uh, it has an open source software development strategy. It's in it got an extensible architecture that enables anyone to add algorithmic functionality. This large and active user community uh, downloaded the desktop application over 240,000 times and launched it 20 million, 2 million times in 2020. Okay, a brief pedantic interlude. I'm a longtime worker in the field of knowledge representation, and I just like to interrupt this presentation to point out that most networks are not relationships between things. They express, express relationships between classes of things. They are rules. So protein A binds protein B is not usually a statement about two actual individual proteins. Maybe if you're looking at a cryo -M EM uh, picture, you could have that uh, representation, but Typically, it's a statement in some circumstances, proteins of type A have been observed to bind proteins of type B. It's a difference between saying, by default, cars have four wheels, and my broken car has three wheels. Okay, I've got that off my chest. On with the presentation. Okay, so core desktop software provides general functionality network input, <clears throat> import and export, integrating the, the networks with the omics data, visualization analysis. And it doesn't exist in isolation, so we're gonna explore the rest of the ecosystem. Now, the core software, as again, I think th this audience, you probably know this, it's extended through lightweight applications that are written for Cytoscape in Java. They are now called apps, like just about everything else in the world, but before that, they were called plugins. Cytoscape was an early adopter of this strategy in our field. And it, wasn't, it was not a common back in 2001, enabling this rapid advancement of uh, analyses and features. So here are some of the hundreds of apps that are arranged on the wall of apps showcase. The app store is actually arranged for easy search and browsing, not just this display. They can be installed directly from the app store or via the desktop app manager interface. So, you can see right there, you've got a one-click button either from the web or <clears throat> uh, on the desktop. Some popular apps include uh, packaged interfaces to, for the visualization and interpretation. One of them is the string app that'll turn up as an example later on, which was written by uh, UCSF Scooter Morris. String is a large database of interactions, as I mentioned, and this app uh, helps you use it in multiple ways. So here's the diagram of the end of the ecosystem and divides it into three blocks. First, you've got the desktop environment with the original application and its apps, but it all there, when we're gonna talk about new ways for scripts and notebooks to access the ecosystem directly. 
Okay. Second, we have web applications. And one of the examples of uh, is the index cloud database, and its interface, more on that later, the iQuery and Gene Mania network gene anal set analysis applications. Uh, for visualization, the web app applications can use the Cytoscape JS JavaScript library, which provides integrated network graphics within web applications. So you can develop things on the web now, and it's not just Java applications um, uh, in the desktop. And since there aren't a whole lot of Java developers in biology these days, uh, that's probably one of the things that you'd be more interested in. Finally, We've got cloud data and analysis services. Okay, if service is not a familiar term to you, services are websites for programs. Instead of downloading web pages, and that's the transactions that your local computer uh, makes. Instead, these are transactions where you ask code on the server to run particular programs and get an answer back. So Cytoscape is evolving to be more and more of a web, cloud, and notebook environment. So expect to see new capabilities available to you in those modes. Ultimately, five years from now, Cytoscape is gonna be a web environment and a cloud environment and a notebook data science environment. The desktop application will still be around and still you know, be supported, but we anticipate that the bulk of use is all gonna be in these more modern environments. So here's the desktop interface for creating networks by loading tabular data, such as protein-protein interactions from an Excel file or a uh, other tabular file. And in these cases, each row corresponds to an edge. And there's great how-to tutorials on loading data and click the link on this slide, or again, just go to setescape.org and find your way there. The table that you load can be very simple. Each row containing only the names of the nodes to be connected, that's often referred to as a simple interaction file or SIF format. But typically, the rows are going to include edge properties such as uh, you know, PPI confidence scores of the type of interaction. And sometimes they include node properties as well. So this interface lets you sort this out for your data telling the loader which rows, uh, sorry, which columns identify the nodes and which are edge properties or node properties. So you can see there that the interface, it's hard to see in this one, but along the top there, you'll find ways that you can click and say, this is the, the one that has the source node in the relationship. This is the one that's the destination node. And uh, these are uh, edge properties or these are node properties at the, uh, to, from each column. Okay, then this is the interface in which you can add your data to an existing network. And that, again, might be fold change or p-value for gene expression change in your perturbation experiment. So one of the things you have to do in this interface is you have to tell, tell it which column uniquely identifies the node on which those expression changes should go. And so it's going to match the network that you already got in there. So if one of them has got a name and, you know, as the unique identifier, and that's a gene symbol, then you've got to have a matching set of gene symbols in your table that you're trying to load on top of it. And you can choose which columns are going to be the key to connect them. Okay, problem column, problem, yeah, a common problem are cells and common identifiers that contain something like A slash B, where somebody wanted to say that uh, the property applies to both isoforms of a protein, or there are two different, there's a uniprot identifier and the gene, and they put them all together in one column. That's human readable, but it isn't going to fly with a machine. So the other thing to watch out for are non-numeric values in a column that you expected were numbers. However, each column is only allowed to have one type of data, and moreover, the things you do with it later are probably going to insist that those are numbers. So if you mix the text with the numbers, then it defaults to text. And now you wind up with a column of text, and that's going to cause you problems later. Once your data is loaded, Cytoscape gives you ways to select subsets of the data based on combinations of node and edge attributes or 
the degree of your node or network topology. A node degree means the number of edges connecting to that node. So you can talk about hub nodes, nodes that have many, many edges and identify them uh, uh, by that filter, saying I only am interested in nodes that have more than 10 edges or something like that. Uh, you can also select them by simple text queries that look at uh, several of the columns, certainly the name and the label for each, uh, each node. Okay, you can then operate on the selected part of the network. And that might mean making a new subset network, but it might also mean uh, 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 taking all of them to go off to a particular analysis. And we'll talk about one of those later. And so here we see the panel interface to the query builder. And then separately, there's a selection menu that gives you immediate access to common operations. So in this example, I first pruned the edges to only use those that are within particular ranges in two columns. And then uh, I used the selection menu to select the nodes that those edges connect. I then made that selection into a new network, the one on the right, which is fragmented into disconnected networks. And of course, it's much, much smaller. So I've zoomed in on a particular part of the data that presumably my parameters made, uh, reflected my interest. Okay, another type of query that you frequently want to use is you find network neighborhoods. And that's what we talked about uh, earlier of, of finding your prox uh, nodes proximal to your data or close to the set of your query nodes. So if it's proteins that are differentially expressed, I want to find the network nearby. Now, what does nearby mean? Uh, well, that's your choice. There isn't a right answer to what nearby means. It, there's different algorithms that you can apply. And then within those algorithms, you have to choose your parameters. So you can set a very loose network, uh, a very loose set of parameters for finding neighbor. And in which case your query selects uh, 300,000 uh, edges out of 420,000. That's not often very useful. On the other hand, you could say, I only want edges that directly connect my nodes. Now, the problem with that is that you know, there are active biology involving uh, proteins that are not regulated in the way that you measured. Uh, you know, that, that your, your proteins of interest do not exist by themselves performing the biology in your particular context. And so if you tighten it up that much, you're losing a lot. You're, you're going to, sometimes you'd like to do that and really hone in, but a lot of times you want to let it move out a bit more. And it's, this is a art, not a science. Uh, it is something where for your data, it is a good idea to experiment with those parameters and see how it changes. Okay, on the left, I've shown the panel interface to the Cytoscape diffusion tool, which is kind of hidden in the interface and is underused. Uh, under tools, it's one of the menu items. That's going to get moved up to be more prominent in some of the web interfaces that we're building. In any way, it calls a remote service that processes the network. So it sends the network off to this remote service, and that processes it with a heat diffusion algorithm that, that in which the initially selected nodes are hot, and their heat is iteratively distributed along the edge of the network. So you can think of it as the network's composed of copper balls connected by copper rods, and we apply a blowtorch on the selected nodes. Run the blowtorch for a little while, then measure the heat on all the balls to determine how close a node is to the originally selected nodes. So you can think of those subnetworks as de novo pathways or functional modules. Now, in the index user interface, again, more about index in a minute, a, a supporting query service supplies one of five fast next neighbors operations shown here. So you can think of it as cheap but crude network propagation, although sometimes it's the better tool for the job. And cheap is often important because you can run a, one of these uh, queries in index and it will come back, you know, in a few seconds for on a very large network, uh, five seconds to uh, find nearest neighbors of uh, 100 nodes in a, uh, a half million edge network. So 
that's way faster than what you can do for a more complex diffusion uh, algorithm or some other network propagation algorithm. Another key use of subsystem finding is the guilt by association principle. So this generates hypotheses for a protein's role in a given context based on the premise that it's likely to share functions with its neighbors. Not, not to say that it's likely to be a kinase if it's next door to a kinase, but rather to say uh, if the other uh, nodes in the immediate vicinity are all about autophagy, well, maybe this one's about autophagy too. And this is really useful in cases uh, in which you have many proteins that are regulated in your experiment, but are poorly described in the literature. And so, uh, frankly, a lot of times I see people just ignoring them. And maybe that's what you have to do because it's just not tractable to really dig down into them. But you may be able to give them tentative functions. And perhaps you would choose to validate them in subsequent experiments if that could really lead somewhere for you, in which case it's great if uh, explored novel biology. OK. Visual styles. You've seen networks in which the color of nodes indicates a property of the entity, a fold change or edge thickness. Fold, uh, fold change for a node or edge thickness for uh, a relationship based on some confidence score for an interaction. So Cytoscape's got this sophisticated visual styling interface that lets you edit these rules for your network. Now, these are rules because the appearance of your network is automatically updated when the underlying data is updated. So you're expressing a rule that says, here's how my data is, is mapped to a style, to a visual property. And then whatever that property is in the network, then that is how you choose the color or the width or whatever. So uh, two views of the styling interface. In one, a continuous range of node color based on a node property is specified. And in the other one, uh, a set, one of a set of shapes is chosen for the node based on a set of possible discrete, discrete values of a type property. So you can see that there are all kinds of different uh, entity types that we expect to have in that network. And for each one of them, we specify what shape it is. So you can see uh, you know, proteins are circles and uh, small molecules or little, little diamonds, stuff like that. However, the interface is very powerful and it includes some advanced features, such as making nodes into pie charts that summarize multiple attributes of the node. Now, those of you who have seen other presentations from me <laughs> know that I love this feature. So, uh, uh, and this slide has a link below to uh, connect you to straight to the um, network visualization tutorials. I forgot to pause before. We're at slide 18 out of 39. Uh, does anybody want to stop and, and uh, ask questions about anything? Okay, I'll plunge on. Now, let's talk about layouts. Obviously, a good layout is will give you a comprehensive view of the data. And the point of a, data, of a layout is it should highlight the relationships between the nodes express the network structure so that that becomes visually apparent to you. And that's often best for smaller networks. It's very easy to have large networks become hairballs of uh, where you can't see what's going on. A thing that we we're working on a lot is to make layouts available that take will take large networks and break them out into their structure. And uh, hopefully we're gonna have more of those readily available in Cytoscape and on, on our web tools soon. The um, kind of networks that you typically think of are the ones on the left-hand side where the uh, ball and spring algorithms or force-directed algorithms as they're better called, uh, tend to group nodes that are more densely connected. And you can see in these examples, they work good for modest sized net, uh, networks. Sometimes people prefer to present their data in simple geometric form. And, uh, you know, clearly there are uh, some things um, uh, such as uh, DNA sequence diagrams of 
uh, that people uh, do that with, um, I very seldom find them useful. And as we'll shortly discuss, sometimes when you're working with hierarchies of concepts and classes, uh, hierarchical layouts are the right way to go. There's a couple of other things that we could dig down to with hierarchical layouts. We've got an uh, application called HiView that uses an interesting circle packing technology. I'm going to skip for now. If we have time at the end and anybody cares about it, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show it to you. So Cytoscape has about two dozen layouts uh, that are supplied by default. Uh, there's a set of them that were made available by the Yworks company, they're really nice. And then some Cytoscape apps provide additional layouts when they, once they install them, the more layouts show up in the menu. A, a layout can also be fine-tuned with an interface that lets you uh, set uh, node alignment and the distribution. So if they're too closely packed together, you can move them out, you can rotate it, things like that. And I'm not going to go into this, but Cytoscape has some graphic um, editing functions where you can add things like text and uh, uh, simple shapes and images on top of your, your network. And um, you know, it's not as sophisticated as uh, taking your network into Illustrator, but it does have the advantage that since they travel with the network, you can, um, somebody else getting the network uh, shared with them will see those immediately instead of only being able to see those if you give them a static uh, figure. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about index and I, the index is my baby. I started that back around 2013. And so it is a central Cytoscape database for network storage, sharing, publication. Here's the index uh, homepage with links of documentation and featured content. I've shown the featured networks menu uh, pulled down in the search interface. And that menu is a great way to start exploring the networks available in index. You can see that there's lots of stuff that we've collaborated with people typically to load uh, that are public resources. And as you can see, CCMI gets top billing in the featured content. So that right now it's taking over the center position to direct people to the um, uh, networks associated with recent publications. Index handles a broad range of networks from small pathway networks to very large interaction data sets. So here's some examples. We have an, an APMS interaction network. We have the BioPlex 3 data, and you can see that the, the interface is capable of displaying quite large networks with reasonable uh, speed. And one uh, network from WikiPathways, you know, WikiPathways, as you may know, is another Gladstone Inst Institute uh, product out of Alex Pico's lab. And at, um, many of those networks, as you can see, have a lot of graphic elements in them, not just uh, ball and stick connections. Okay, both labs and individual researchers can store networks and index accounts. And that gives you a Dropbox for networks for daily use. Uh, a lot of my uh, scripts and stuff uh, are built all around taking stuff in and out of index. And that's becoming more and more of a standard use case, especially in the Eidecker lab. So you can make your networks public or keep them private, and you can share them with specific users and groups. So the typical network, uh, uh, the typical file permissions kind of stuff. You can organize your networks using network sets. The network sets are collections of bookmarks that can reference any network. So you can have a network set that both bookmarks some of your networks and it can bookmark some public networks. And so that makes it very convenient as a way to share a set of networks that you're, you've been working on or to organize them for your project because you may want to keep both your stuff at hand and also be uh, able to quickly find public resources that you're relying on or resources from other people. So here's an example of uh, a lab uh, exposing their networks to the world as their lab homepage. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, 
uh, you have the opportunity to explicitly control what networks you showcase onto your public view. So you're, uh, if somebody who comes to that is just a regular uh, user who doesn't have any particular permissions to see your networks, then the ones that you showcase will be visible. And you have a place where obviously I've shown here, able to customize the description with an image and uh, do some formatting on the, on the font. And so it becomes a nice way to pre present those uh, to your world. So if you have a bunch of resources that you're managing or networks that were associated with your publications, then here's a place you can send people that is uh, our stuff. Oh, and a really important point about that is your lab doesn't have to maintain, you know, its own uh, web page and server that uh, is going to distribute these. You have a dissemination channel that's already pre-built for you. Now, here's a diagram of, uh, you know, the networks and the accounts that's showing that authors can cite networks and index from their publications via a DOI, a digital object identifier. And so we can mint uh, DOIs for you. Right now it's not completely self-service, but it's a quick process. And so if you are gonna publish a network, generally make it available, get a DOI for it. And now it's got a stable place for anybody to find it. And index is archival. So if you lock down something and say, this is read only, and I've got a DOI, it'll be around. We've got a uh, guarantee of uh, continued funding from the um, uh, from UCSD in the sense that even if funding for index completely collapses, the database will still be there with preserving access to those things. Um, but in this capacity, as you know, archival issuing DOIs, every able to freely share stuff, uh, we're a fair compliant repository and we've been accepted as a recommended repository for Springer Nature and PLOS. Okay, I was mentioning my use of these in uh, my, my programs, my, my notebooks. So unlike a static figure or a spreadsheet of interaction data in your supplementary materials, your reader can immediately use a network and index with all the tools of the Cytoscape ecosystem. So you've got a one-click download into Cytoscape if they are a Cytoscape user. Uh, in index, they can immediately clone it as a private copy. And I can access it by a script. I can have my script immediately take the network that uh, you publish and I can process it. And you know, if I'm interested, that's probably an avenue for us to open a collaboration. Okay, next topic. I briefly referenced iQuery before, and iQuery is an index uh, application, and it is a gene set analysis application, and it's based off of the networks and index. And so we uh, identify sets of, net of networks that are public resources and that are, you know, good ne good networks that we we would stand by as being ones that would be worth you uh, using in your uh, in, in your analysis. And it's set up so that it runs multiple analyses all at once. And so a single query performs both pathway enrichment within three different tabs and queries to protein, protein, and gene disease, protein drug, gene tissue, reference interaction networks. So I'm gonna gloss over iQuery right now. Uh, we can, again, we have, if anybody wants to go into it in more detail at, at the end, I'll, we can uh, run it and I'll show it to you. But uh, I invite you to try it out with your favorite genes uh, in, or one of our example queries. Okay, clustering. So one of the big things that people do to interpret networks is to cluster them. And we talk about exposing the, the structure of the network. So algorithms that operate on networks and identify their structure, pull them apart so that you uh, uh, call different regions of the networks that are more closely related to each other than they are to other parts of the network clusters. And so this is done by several Cytoscape apps, 
including cluster maker, cytocluster, cluster viz, and M code. And there's links below to take you to the clustering apps uh, on the Cytoscape app, uh, desktop and to documentation on the very powerful cluster maker app. The, um, and by the way, that's another Scooter Morris app. Scooter is the most amazingly prolific author of, uh, of apps and Cytoscape, and that's not all he does. It's, he's amazing. The use of community detection, then, you find uh, it you know, is a well-established technique. And these uh, have, this technique's been successfully applied to problems such as identifying complexes or uh, prioritizing potential disease genes. So very typically, the visualization of these is networks with a layout that pulls the cluster apart and uh, with uh, coloring in order to highlight the, uh, the community to which a given node is, is assigned. More recently, the Cytoscape Toolkit has expanded to include multi-scale community detection tools. And so these generate, visualize, and use hierarchical structured models that are derived from the network. So I think you probably all know that you know, Go, the gene ontology, as it being an ontology, what it is is it's a hierarchy. It's ultimately is expressed as a large hierarchical network. And so that makes a lot of sense. Hierarchical structure is a fundamental principle of biology, where phenotypes emerge not only through interactions, but through biological systems at multiple scales. So multi-scale community detection, which has been a focus of uh, one of the research focuses of the Idaker lab for quite a few years now, exposes this biological stru structure. So you find clusters at multiple levels of granularity, and then the algorithm arranges them in hierarchies in which smaller clusters are subsumed by larger clusters. So this is different from Go in a very important way. So Go is contributed to by huge numbers of people, but the, um, the, the, the assignment of a given protein to a given cluster, uh, to a given ontology term rather in Go, it kind of is across all possible contexts, right? So if uh, protein A can be involved in uh, autophagy, yeah, but it may not be involved in autophagy in your system, in your context. Uh, and so it, you, you, it becomes a blurry view of the, uh, of the functions. And of course, there's a uh, uh, curator bias that you, you can, you can uh, dis despite the fact that Go is an amazing achievement, nonetheless, if you're there using it and you look at it closely, you can find some, uh, you can find some, some terms that are not, uh, don't come up to my standards anyway. However, the community detection from data, whether or not you think it's a good, uh, a, a given analysis, it's a good partitioning of, the, of your, uh, uh, of, of the relationships that you have in your given network that you used and was focused on by your particular data, Nonetheless, it, you know exactly where it came from. You and it is specific to your context. And so it's real data. It's, um, and you can then analyze those communities. So we have an app inside Escape, which is um, Psi Community Detection. And it uses, uh, like Diffusion, it uses a, as a, a remote server, which generates the models and then hands them back to you. So here's a workflow. You create an interaction network from protein binding data from a tumor cell line, and then you annotate the nodes with mutational frequency data. From that network, then you'll use diffusion to select a subnetwork focused on the mutated genes and those nearby. This focus network is focused on your biology now we're going to take it apart with a, uh, and create a hierarchical model. The communities in that model, again, they're putative cellular pathways, but now they're really fine-grained compared to just doing the diffusion. 
And then you can and the, analyzing them, then you can analyze them and see what they're enriched for with standard pathway analysis. And so in this case, frequently mutated genes that are enrichment for those in a community suggests the hypothesis that this community could reflect an oncogenic mechanism. So now you want to be able to investigate that community further. There's a network there. Do you have the network where, which was the original interaction do you use? And you can also try superimposing those um, genes on other networks. You can find other relationships from different sources to uh, investigate those members. So the small green network here is, the, is, is that final community output. Here's the uh, interface to CDAPs. And in this case, you'll see that I've got a network current and Cytoscape. I go to the apps menu and I find community detection and I generate a hierarchy with it. They, this um, wizard box has come up uh, for me to choose parameters for the high def algorithm that uh, was done by uh, Fan Zheng in the uh, Eidecker lab. But there's several standard uh, uh, community detection algorithms that are also available on the service. And you can pick between them and uh, they are, uh, actually, I'll, I'll stop and say something I, that I am very pleased with, with this service is it's self-configuring. We can add a new algorithm on the back end, just plugging it in, and the interface gets the information on uh, what parameters to get for your, for, for the, uh, 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 to control the algorithm, and it supplies that information in a way that this uh, dialog box is automatically generated. Um, kudos to Chris Churros for implementing that. Okay, we get this uh, uh, hierarchy back, and uh, this hierarchy is in a uh, just just in a uh, ball and stick layout that has tended to put the uh, central nodes in the middle, and uh, but we could move it into a uh, more traditional hierarchy as well. The um, the red coloring in this is related to all those labels. So where did those labels come from? Because they're really useful for me to figure out what's going on in those communities. And so I, um, the site so community detection uh, uh, automatically assigns tentative names to the communities based on doing a functional enrichment analysis in uh, the popular G profiler service, or you can use iQuery. And so it will hand you back a set of names where the, the top hit, the, mo the most enriched term is uh, placed on your community. So, you know, this lays out the, the, the structure for you that otherwise you've got this massive number of communities. And if you were going to skip through each one of them and examine the underlying network, it would take you forever. Uh, so this is great, but you got to take this with a grain of salt and actually about two grains of salt because the best match in the enrichment analysis may still apply only to a small minority of the genes or proteins in that given community. And that's true for other GO analyses, by the way, that uh, you know when you're doing a, a standard GO analysis, I uh, suggest in that context to look under the hood because you may find that your uh, um, assignment of a given um, process to your set of genes may hinge on only a small number. You know, out of 20, maybe the enrichment was all based on four. And so there's 16 other genes there that weren't part of that enrichment, right? And moreover, maybe the second hit, the second uh, uh, most enriched term might be uh, a different four genes. So you've actually got two things going on and you took only the one that by small margin was the best. So, oh, and finally, sometimes you will see that your genes that really I, um, I serve to the, uh, be the enrichment hits, the basis of the, of the good enrichment p-value, were all common, um, uh, highly 
uh, connected and highly researched genes. And so actually they're in a lot of terms. And so you haven't actually distinguished your biology very well, that it may turn out that you only have one protein that is actually uh, distinguishing this set of genes from 10 other sets of genes in terms of what process it, it is. So watch out when all your, um, your um, genes that uh, uh, characterize your community or any uh, set of genes are all uh, cytokines or uh, core pathway genes, uh, receptors, well-known receptors. That, that's, that's definitely a warning signal. Um, okay, next. I'm finally back to <clears throat> telling you that R and Python scripts are now have a lot more uh, status in the Cytoscape ecosystem. And the thing that's been worked on for, uh, geez, six years now, I think, uh, are uh, the ability to control the Cytoscape desktop application directly so that your Python script or your R script can uh, take a running copy of Cytoscape and do things with it. it. You can send networks over there and perform operations on them. And once you're done, you can get the answer back. So uh, it, it's um, uh, made pretty easy to do. There are two very good uh, packages, a Python package that is called Pi for Cytoscape and the RSI3 R package. And Here's a very quick little snippet that I've, I've put on this slide showing a Jupyter notebook that loads in a network into Cytoscape and applies a visual style and performs a network layout. And so there's a, a, you know, a mock-up of the one small network created and how it, it also appears over on your screen in Cytoscape while your, while your script is running. And you, of course, you can also use this in your notebook where you do one step uh, in uh, programmatically in one cell and then go to the next uh, cell. But before you go there, go over to Cytoscape and do some uh, interactive work for something that you need to tweak and then go on with your, your, uh, your notebook. So many Cytoscape apps now have been extended to support access via Cyrest. And that lets you do some more complex workflows. And coming back to the string app here, um, the string app is now fully accessible via Cyrest. And so the uh, user can perform multiple network interpretation analyses. So for example, here's the string app performing gene set enrichment on a, ne a network driven by a, an R script, and then uh, it gets back the results both as data, but you can actually have Cytoscape generate you an image and hand you the image back into your, uh, into your notebook. And then as a, a minor thing on the, the side, Cyrest is available to uh, web-based browser applications. So something running in the browser can also say, uh, hey, Cytoscape, do this. And one thing that we do all the time is that the index web interface, uh, while you're running that uh, web interface, it looks to see if Cytoscape is running every so often. And when Cytoscape is running, this button lights up. And when it's lit up, you can just click and directly download the current network into Cytoscape. So this is great if somebody has come from your paper to your uh, network and index, they're viewing it and they're a Cytoscape user and they can just pop their, that network right down into Cytoscape and do what they want to with it. Okay, I'm 10 minutes early and here's this big acknowledgement page. We're actually working on a Cytoscape paper in progress. And so I just put on the uh, uh, the author list, and we went back to find uh, all the people over the last 20 years who are primary developers, and so uh, wanted to uh, you know, acknowledge everybody. I'd 
uh, I meant to put the current uh, people on as, with pictures, but um, didn't quite get to that today. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Are there questions in the chat? Doesn't seem to be any have come in yet, but maybe people will uh, will pipe up now with the opportunity. So Ryan was wondering, um, are all the tutorials uh, for the, the specific parts available on the website? Yes, yes. This this uh, presentation isn't available there yet, but yeah, er everything's there except there are a few things, I guess, on the index website that are not on the Cytoscape website yet. So I'd also, uh, if you're interested in using index, you, you should go directly to index and go to the index documentation first. If you're interested in the, the workflows that I showed you that you use Cytoscape for, Cytoscape org just has everything. And that there's a, um, a whole page for to, uh, all the tutorials and presentations and then there's another whole page with all the code examples for using the interface that allows you to control Cytoscape from your Python and R scripts. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, Dexter, if you have any advice when you know you you need to manipulate multiple layers of data, like you know, like you have RNA, protein, phosphorylation, and you want to map that onto a network. Like, what would you be the approach you would you would use, like pie charts, or I mean, how would you concatenate all those data using Cytoscape if you can? Yeah, I so for seeing it simultaneously, I like the pie charts a lot. Yeah, and. Um, in order to do that, um, we, we, we wanted to do that a lot in, at two layers in the, um, uh, in, in the uh, SI community detection app, because you'd start out with a network on which you projected multiple data sets. And we've done that for a couple of projects now. And then when you make the communities, you kind of want to see which communities are hot with which kind of data. And so we uh, created a, a tool called Tally Attributes that then will go back and look at your original network. And for the nodes in your community, it will check, it will sum up the tallies for uh, each of those nodes and will um, uh, then uh, create a pie chart showing you the breakdown for that community of how much of it is. Um, modulated or not, and then different pies for different kinds of modulation. So we have a couple of examples that, you know, if you want to follow up with me on that, where we, uh, you know, there was phosphorylation data up, down, ubiquitylation data up, down, protein expression data up, down. And so I made six uh, different colors in the pie. Okay, cool. And so, so yeah, I like those a lot, but, you know, you can, it's, it's not a bad idea also to just make up some different styles for your network. So you mm -hmm. have the same layout, have four different pictures of the layout. Yes, that's what I've been doing, but I was wondering is there is like, you know, like the pie chart thing I never use. So I think I'm going to try. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and also like those community detections and all of that, I think would be great, especially like yeah, with proteomic and photoproteomic data, I think it would be. Uh, yeah. Cool. And, and, and let me say this to everybody, you know, if you've got, if you want to help, just, you know, give me a call and I or one of the people on my team can help you succeed with this. And especially we're very committed to help helping you succeed with community detection since that's like a, uh, a particular research interest uh, in the lab as well as, uh, you know, the, the pure cytoscape. Hi, Dexter. I want to add to and transpoint and your point, actually. So um, Cytoscape, we've been using Cytoscape and we love it. So uh, we've done different analysis with that, very uh, insightful into the data. But it's such an overwhelming uh, amount of apps they have now that without being an expert, you can do like so many different things, right? So many, and you might miss so many things. So that's what I was gonna ask like, do you have office hours or can we contact you? Because it would be great already knowing how to use and kind of what Antoine said, like I want to explore other things. So you might have a better idea of like 
hey, I will follow this workflow and this structure. Yep. yep. Okay, Absolutely. great. Thanks. And thanks for the great presentation and kind of building on this great platform. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it worked for you. Does anyone else out there have any, uh, any questions? Okay. As if not, we're almost at the hour, so we might close it out. Um, Dexter, thank you so much for hosting this. Um, hopefully next year's one will be able to get back in person for it because we'd love to host you up here in, uh, in San Francisco. And not sure if we'll end up going down to San Diego next month for the CCMI gathering. I, I don't think it may happen. Um, for, yeah. for all of the attendees, we do have an additional course. It may be the last one in the Cancer Cell Mapping Initiative ser series. On April 7th, um, the Molecular Ecology Initiative up here in UCSF are going to host a 90-minute like seminar on how to utilize C-BioPortal. It's mainly relevant for the UCSF uh, cohort of samples, but it's a UCSD have a similar um, have a similar program, so a lot of the questions will address the same uh, will address the same answers. So we'll advertise that and we'll send out a registration link over the coming weeks. But it's on April seventh at three thirty p.m. Um, with that, thank you very much. Thanks all for attending, and I think I successfully recorded it correctly. So we'll uh, post that up on a. Uh, on, on Dexter's Site Escape YouTube channel. Awesome. Thanks for inviting me. Cheers. Thanks, guys.